Kayla Woody. She is a prevention specialist with the Citizen Potawatomi Nation that's located in Shawnee. It's called the House of Hope. The reason um, for the connection here is that, I and mean, she's gonna talk about that here in a few minutes, um, is that the service area has expanded and they also serve more people. So location of where she's at is 1310 South Gordon Cooper Drive in Shawnee. So Kayla, we have made you a co-host. Um, so when you're ready, go ahead and start sharing your um, screen. Thank and you. Begin. Thank you so much. All right, good afternoon, everyone. You might give me just a second on the screen share. Hopefully it will work for me. Can everyone see that website? Yes. Okay, great, wonderful. Well, again, thank you so much for allowing me the time to speak today about our program. Um, my name is Kayla, like she had mentioned. Um, the House of Hope is an organization out of Shawnee that is ran by the Citizen Potawatomi Nation tribe. Um, and we offer free assistance to any individual that is experiencing domestic violence, stalking, or sexual assault. Um, and when I say any individual, I know that we are um, ran by a tribe here in Oklahoma, but we do assist Native and non-Native individuals. Um, I think that's a, a question that a lot of people have. So I want to kind of get that out of the way just in the beginning. Um, and of course, we can proudly assist anyone regardless of their gender, age, race, sexual orientation, economic status. We are here to support anyone who is struggling in those types of situations and are needing safety and help um, from violence. Uh, we do serve five counties here in Oklahoma, um, those being Pottawatomie County, Lincoln County, Seminole County, Oklahoma, and Cleveland um, for services. But if, if we do receive um, a client from outside of that service area, we are here to help them locate services in their service area. Um, on the website, we actually have a lot of different resources. Um, we have a national resource directory um, that lists quite a few different numbers for domestic violence hotlines, sexual violence hotlines, um, you know, anything from suicide prevention to teen dating violence, um, substance abuse, mental health. We try to list a lot of different resources on there. Um, we also have a link for domestic violence shelters in the state of Oklahoma. So if someone is seeking safety away from an abusive intimate partner. Um, and <clears throat> our shelter is not close enough to them or in an area where they feel safe, we can try to locate another shelter for them um, that best fits their needs. Um, we also have a state homeless shelter um, list as well for those who maybe leaving a situation, maybe it's not domestic violence um, or stalking uh, sexual assault, but they find themselves without a home. Um, we really try to provide them with those resources because again, we want to keep them safe, um, keep them out of conditions and make sure they're taken care of. Oh, let me go back here. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about our services, we do offer a variety of services to our clients. One of those being the emergency shelter um, that I talked about. Um, that emergency shelter is located in Pottawatomie County and is open to um, women who are victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, or stalking, um, and their children. We don't accept um, male victims in our shelter, but again, we can locate um, an other shelter for them that is um, more for male residents, um, or we can try to come up with some type of situation to, again, get them out of that abusive situation and keep them safe. Um, we also offer community advocacy to our clients, um, which provides a lot of different um, resources and services. Um, one of those, of course, is safety planning. 
That is our main concern with our clients is to make sure that they are safe and out of that abuse and that violence in their home. Um, so we go over a variety of ways for them to keep themselves safe, um, to keep their children safe, to keep their family safe. Um, we will sit down with them and create a safety plan that best fits them. Um, this can look like things, um, you know, creating safety words with their children, um, talking to their neighbors and explaining the situation. Um, so if a, a violent outburst comes up, um, they have a way of notifying someone um, for safety. We talk about um, if there is escalation in the home, uh, the best way to get out of that escalation, whether it be, you know, not being in a room with um, just one exit or a room that may have weapons like a kitchen with knives and things like that. So we really try to prepare our clients um, for those escalations and what they can do to keep themselves safe. Um, for our clients who are um, going through legal proceedings, um, whether that be divorce, um, protective orders, um, whether that be filing charges against that abuser, we have advocates that can go to the courthouse, um, to these legal proceedings with the client to help them feel supported, um, to prepare them for what to expect. Um, court can be a very anxious time for anyone, um, but for a victim of domestic violence who has to face their abuser in court, it can be extremely anxious and um, very much terrifying. So we want to be there to support them and lift them up. Um, we provide parenting education classes. Um, it's an eight week course, it's completely free. Um, we provide a lot of great information um, like family communication, um, the best way to encourage good behavior in our children, um, tech safety with our children. We talk about healthy relationships, how to teach our children about those healthy relationships. Um, there's a lot of different topics that we go over. Um, and at the end of the eight weeks, we provide them with a certificate of completion that they can then provide to a caseworker, a judge, um, an attorney, whoever may be asking or seeking that information. Um, there is another program that we um, provide with our community um, clients that's called Address Confidentiality. So it's a program that's set up through the state of Oklahoma um, that allows residents to really keep their address confidential um, and locked down. So they're provided with a free PO box number um, and can actually give this out as a physical address under um, certain state laws to keep their location confidential and safe so that they're um, abuser cannot locate them. Um, so many times we see that you can pretty much pull any address off the internet um, if it's made public. So we really want to try to help them keep that location confidential. Um, and then, of course, we provide all kinds of referrals to different community resources and organizations just like you all um, to make sure that we are taking care of our clients and getting them everything that they need to succeed um, and start over from this abusive relationship. So those are a lot of our different types of services that we offer here. Again, they are all confidential, completely free to the client. Um, and we really put that together to best fit their needs. Um, so even if it's not a service that we normally offer, if we have to try to you know, pull some strings and make some phone calls to figure out um, you know, how we can help that client find a new job or a new residence, um, child care, um, insurance, you know, medical insurance, whatever we can do to help them with that, we will um, provide that assistance. Um, for our clients who maybe are not ready to leave that situation yet, um, maybe there, there's a lot of different reasons why a victim doesn't leave their abuser. Um, there's so much stigma around that, but for many victims, it is extremely difficult to leave that situation. Um, so for those clients, we do offer a 24 seven crisis line. So if they find themselves in crisis, um, in an explosive situation, 
they can call our crisis, crisis hotline number um, to receive support from our advocates. Um, we go over safety planning tips. Um, we try to encourage them in that situation um, to keep them safe um, because a lot of times with this abuse, their self-esteem has been brought down. Um, it's very difficult for them to keep going. So we want to be there to assist them in that. Um, and then of course we provide um, community education, which is kind of what I'm doing now. Um, we go out in various communities and talk about what domestic violence is, what sexual assault is, um, you know, what we can do as community members to make sure that we are encouraging victims, that we are keeping them safe. Um, how can we help uh, those in our community who are experiencing domestic violence? Because we see that one in three women and one in four men will experience in, you know, relation, relationship violence in their lifetime. Um, that's a pretty staggering number. If you think about, you know, just those in your family, you know, I have, I have two boys. So there's a pretty good chance that one of them is, is going to have to deal with some type of relationship abuse. Um, so it's just so good to really try to get that information out. We really focus heavy on our youth population. Um, we see that they are the most vulnerable when it comes to violence. Um, we see that uh, 15 to 24-year-old 24, 24 girls are the most vulnerable when we talk about relationship violence and domestic violence. So if we can educate them, teach them what a healthy relationship looks like, um, that they can set boundaries and that they deserve what real love looks like. We can stop that violence before it even has a chance to really set in with them. Um, so we, we really get, you know, we go into our schools, our public schools, our universities, our tech schools, and we just talk with our kids. We ask them, you know, what does love look like to you? We talk to them about signs of unhealthy relationships and what a healthy relationship looks like. Um, and then we talk to them about how do you help a friend or a family member or, you know, a coworker or a teammate who is going through domestic violence or dating violence. That way we can really spread that information um, and really prevent, again, that violence before it starts. Um, we also go out into a variety of organizations, um, businesses, you name it. We go to doctor's offices, you know, law offices, tax offices. We want to talk to as many people as we can to inform them of how domestic violence affects them because domestic violence not only affects us in our home life, it affects us in our work life. Um, we see that about 8 million days a year are lost to domestic abuse, um, which is crazy because we only have 365 days in a year, but there are over 8 million days that are lost in the workplace because of domestic violence, which equates to about 32,000 full-time jobs um, that are being lost because of, of you know, relationship abuse. Um, and it, it's not just with the victim either. We see that these abusers also are losing work time because of you know, legal proceedings and arrests and incarceration, which is then hurting the employer. Um, it's a huge economic um, loss as well as a financial loss for so many people. Um, we see about $727 million annually um, in productivity that's lost in our workforce each year. Um, and that's not even including medical costs. Um, that medical costs are about $4 million a year, you know, because work, you know, employers are having to provide those, you know, higher insurance premiums and it's, it's a huge cost. Um, you know, we also see security as an issue when that domestic violence moves from the home to the workplace. Um, there was actually a story that I was able to locate um, back in 2019 
a Florida man decided that he was going to follow his wife to work and he opened fire on her um, in front of her job, shot her multiple times. Um, he was he was killed by police um, and thankfully no one else was hurt, but it could have been so much worse um, hurting you know, other employees or customers. So domestic violence has a huge impact on our workforce on our you know relationships on you know our personal lives so we really want to make sure that we're educating people that we're bringing information about domestic violence to our communities so we can make changes um, on what these relationships look like um, when we talk about really what is domestic violence there's some great information on our website um, if you go kind of to the fourth section here we talk about family violence, dating violence, stalking. Um, we give a lot of great tips, um, but really the most important thing here is we list those warning signs. So really what to look for. If you know someone who may be experiencing violence in their relationship, or maybe if you're unsure if you're experiencing it in your relationship. Um, underneath our um, forms page, we have some great resources we have some relationship quizzes to determine if your relationship is healthy um, or maybe a friend you can encourage them to take it um, and then we also have a quiz that determines um, how lethal your relationship may be if you know it's abusive um, how much danger you may be in um, so those can be extremely helpful um, and then of course we offer assistant applications on our website. So if you know someone who's experiencing um, domestic violence or sexual assault or stalking, um, they can go onto our webpage, fill out this application for assistance. It remains completely confidential. None of this information is shared with anyone. Um, and our advocates can review that information and contact that client um, and, and really try to help them in that situation. Um, and then of course we have our parenting education application on there as well if someone is interested in taking um, parenting education classes to assist um, really in you know, furthering their parenting skills. Um, if you are interested in, um, oh sorry, if you're interested in either more information about our organization and um, maybe you would like us to come out and speak to your staff to your classroom um, to your clients um, we would be more than happy to do that and um, we have contact information on our website you can just um, call here under our main office number um, and i will also put my email in the chat box so you have that and we would be happy to set up a date if you know someone who is experiencing violence and you would like for them to get assistance um, we have our crisis line number here um, as well as um, a get help tab where they can click and it provides them with um, a variety of ways to reach out for help whether it's for shelter um, maybe they're not ready to leave but they just need to talk to somebody under our crisis line um, maybe they they've already left and they need some community resources um, or maybe they have been um, recently assaulted and they need to speak to someone about an exam. Um, we, we also have a number there for that as well. Um, but I will go ahead and leave it up to some questions um, if anyone has any for me. Kayla, thank you so much. That was a lot of great information. And um, I certainly wrote down a lot myself. I'm old school, so I took a bunch of notes over here. <laughs> um, but yes, this is terrific information. And the point that you made about how it impacts the workforce is so important for this group that you're speaking to. Um, but I did have a couple of questions um, yeah, of course. for you in particular. So. When someone uh, is in your shelter and, and understandably this is a, a safe place for them and certainly anonymity is important and all that, um, how do you all handle transportation? Let's say they're a family that doesn't have transportation. 
Um, and then I'm going to further ask an, um, an additional question, which is uh, what type of academics or uh, education do you provide the children while they're in the shelter? Um, so when we talk about transportation, um, it's really it really depends on the victim's situation. We definitely want to keep the confidentiality of our shelter location, um, but we wanna keep that victim safe. So we normally have meetup spots. Um, we've had, we've reached out before where a victim's friend could bring them to this specific location and then we could take them the rest of the way. Um, we have, you know, purchased plane tickets. We have purchased bus tickets. Um, we have paid for, you know, Ubers and cabs, we want to make sure that we can keep that person safe. And we will figure out a way to try to do that. If they, if we can't get them to our location, um, we will try to locate a shelter nearby um, to get them to that location. Um, when we talk about our youth, um, were you interested about youth in our shelter or when we educate youth in the schools? So, um, so many uh, folks that are on this call, some of them are case managers. So this may be something that they might um, have in terms of a question. So, and I was, I was coming at it from the, um, the point of a case manager. So if I was to refer a client or someone I was helping to your program, they may want to know about, you know, how does this disrupt my child's education? So oh, do you okay. guys online? Um, how, I mean, what plan do you all have specifically in your shelter there? You know, we have had this question come up before um, with residents who are, of course, relocating quite a ways. You know, I'm going to have to take my child to a new school or um, how's that going to work? Um, with the ability to have online classes, we actually have computers and internet in our shelter. So um, a lot of parents do like to choose that option, um, but if not, we do try to help them to get their children um, into a program that's nearby. A lot of time our shelter residents are only staying for a temporary time, um, so maybe two weeks, maybe a month. Um, a lot of times they are, a, we're able to help them locate a new residence to move to, whether it be their own, you know, a new residence that they are either renting or purchasing. Um, we can relocate them to, you know, new family, um, friends. So we really try to work with that parent on what is best, um, what's, I guess I should say kind of convenient, but also to get that child into a you know public you know whether a public school setting or an online school setting um we're definitely grateful for the, the online public school um but it really is just kind of up to the parent in the situation of how we can do that okay so that kind of answered a question that i was going to follow up so it okay. is a temporary situation and it sounds yes. like if you're purchasing bus tickets airplane tickets things like that so if someone needs to reach out to maybe a family member in a different state yes. that they might not have connectivity with, but need to now, that's something that you guys can assist them with. Yes, um, we have reached out, um, you know, sometimes, like I said, we can reach out and, you know, find new rentals in that area and try to help them get set up. Um, a lot of times we can offer um, to pay first month's rent. Um, to really help offset those financial difficult, um, difficulties that come up when they're leaving that situation. Um, so we try to partner up with as many um, different organizations as we can to, to really fill those needs for those clients. 